Hello, it is Sunday the 7th of June 2020. My name is Hannah Patton and today we're going to be looking at a passage in the book of Joel in the Old Testament. Last week was Pentecost Sunday and we had a look at the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit doing in us? Um, how do we understand the Holy Spirit? And today I want to go to Joel because when the, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, Peter got up and he started preaching and the passage that he used for his sermon was in Joel. So I thought it would be a good place for us to go if we're wanting to try and understand a little bit more about the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in us. So I'm going to read uh, from Joel chapter 2 beginning at verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows but that he may turn and have pity and leave a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. The context in Joel 2 is that at the beginning of Joel, there's this plague of locusts which strips the land absolutely bare. And Joel, the prophet, speaks to the people and says, look, our response to this plague, we've got nothing left, should be to seek God. And he says to the people, come and return to the Lord your God um, with fasting and weeping and mourning. And then he uses that powerful line, rend your hearts and not your garments, meaning tear open your hearts before God, not just your clothes. Don't make a show of returning to God, but actually turn to him in your hearts and surely he will turn and um, have mercy. I do encourage you to read through the book of Joel and to get to know the story uh, for yourselves. But it seems to me that um, what Peter is doing when he's using the passages in Joel is that he's pointing the people who are listening to him towards repentance, towards this returning to God. Repentance is a funny old word, isn't it? Um, it's very, very hard to say sorry and to seek forgiveness. I know that in my own life. Sorry seems to be the hardest word and you probably know that too. It's easier to make excuses and we know that in politics, don't we, at the moment and also in um, big, uh, big events and big issues that are hitting our news. It's very hard to say sorry and to repent and to say we're wrong. Why is repentance so important as Christians? Well, firstly, let me say that repentance isn't about trying to make ourselves a better person in our own strength. It's not trying to just try harder or be seen to be better to earn God's love and to earn our place with him. Jesus died for us because we couldn't ever reach that standard of trying to be the best we possibly could for God. Repentance is important because essentially it makes space for God in our hearts. We can become so full of ourselves and so full of um, our own self-righteousness that it's very easy to forget that it's God's righteousness that works in our lives to save us and to change us. Um, and so we need to repent because we need to make space for God um, to work on us and to work in our hearts. So how do we approach repentance and um, and uh, saying sorry? Well, first of all, I want to suggest that we start with God. Um, it's very easy when we're saying sorry to God to start with ourselves. Um, and that is dangerous because it can lead us into a cycle of shame and uh, that's a very difficult place to climb out from. If we start with ourselves and, you know, I'm such a bad person or, you know, th there's no hope for me, it's very difficult to move from there to receiving God's grace. But if we start with God, we remember that God is good, 
that he wants to forgive us. There's nobody that God doesn't want to forgive. He wants to forgive us um, and that we're safe with him. One of the reasons that I think politicians find it very hard to confess is because as a society we've built up such a quick to judge attitude to those who lead us. Um, so it's very hard for people to say, look, I was wrong, because the immediate thing is that people are going to be asking for them to resign uh, straight away. We're very quick to judge those who lead us and we, we're slow with grace on that. Um, and that's not to say that, they, that our leaders should not be uh, repenting and saying sorry, but I don't think we make it very easy for them either. I remember hearing a story from a woman called Corrie Ten Boom who was in concentration camps um, during the Second World War and she became, a well she was a Christian, um, and she became a, an international speaker after the war uh, speaking about forgiveness and love and grace and, and the power of God to heal. And um, after one of her talks she was approached by a man and she instantly recognised him. He were, had been a, a very cruel prison guard in one of the camps that she'd been in and he came up to her and asked her if she would um, forgive him and uh, after a real struggle um, and actually relying very much on the power of the Holy Spirit in that moment Corrie Ten Boom was able to forgive him and she said You've never felt the love of God as you as you do when you are forgiving your neighbour. Now that shows me lots of things, but it shows me that God wanted to forgive that man because he loved him. And if God wanted to forgive a cruel concentration camp guard, he certainly wants to forgive you. There is nothing that you have done that God doesn't want to forgive. God wants to forgive forgive you and in forgiving you he wants to set you free. So firstly start with God, remember who it is that you're confessing to and that he's good and that he's on your side. Secondly, return to God as Lord. Um, this passage says that uh, rend your heart and not your garments and return with fasting and weeping and mourning. This is about recognising that we all need a saviour. None of us are good enough. That's why Jesus came to die for us, because we can't do it on our own. We need God to forgive us. So remember to start with God and then to recognise that we need him to save us from where we are. Thirdly, be honest. Now, how many of us have said, I'm sorry, but, and then given our reasons for doing what we did. Well, that is not a true apology. It's very powerful to be apologised to, and also to apologise with no excuses. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, it was wrong of me. I'm sorry I talked about you behind your back. Or on a more personal level, in something that I feel has been really on my heart recently. I'm sorry I judged you by, the, by your outward appearance. I'm sorry I made a presumption about you based on the colour of your skin. There are all kinds of reasons that we need to apologise. But let's do it without excuses. Let's do it without conditions. Let's confess our sins fully from the heart without an excuse. So start with God, recognise that you need God to save you, be honest, no excuses and also receive the forgiveness that you've been offered. As Corrie Ten Boom also said in another one of her talks, don't go fishing. When you've been forgiven, don't go and dredge it all back up again. Accept the forgiveness of God and the freedom that he brings. Now, I was looking through this uh, book of Joel. It's not very long, so you can read it quite easily in one sitting. Um, and you might like to read it and answer the question, what does God offer when we return to him? What does God offer when we return to him? And I'm going to give you some of the answers. There's probably a lot more, uh, but here are some of them. God offers 
salvation, rescue, protection, abundance, restoration, provision, God provides for us, identity, we become able to be called God's children, confidence, joy, no more shame, no more shame. What would life look like with no more shame? The Holy Spirit poured into our hearts to continue to change and renew us. And signs and wonders. God offers miraculous intervention into our lives to transform our situations. So receive those things into your life. Rejoice in them. The goodness of God for you, not because you deserve it, just simply because you return to God. And you might be thinking, and you might have been thinking for a while during lockdown, that, that God might be just calling you. Um, some of us just have that sense in our hearts, I think God is calling me. I think he might be trying to tell me something. And you can't explain it, but you just know it. Maybe it's a new thing. Maybe it's always been there all your life. You think, God's been trying to speak to me. And if that's the case, then yes, he is. That's not something that you're making up. And now might be the time that you want to make a decision to invite him into your life. And it's very easy to do that. Um, as we hear in the book of Acts, when Peter has preached his sermon, the first thing that happens is that everybody says, what, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptised. So it's very easy to start your journey with God. Simply repenting, which means turning away from life as it is and turning towards Jesus. Um, and also being baptised. A lot of you might have been baptised already, but um, there's always ways of renewing those vows um, as an adult if you're baptised as a child. I'm going to pray for us now. If you want to pray a prayer of inviting Jesus into your life, then please do. Um, and if you do pray that prayer now or any time, um, please do get in touch with me because I'd love to hear you, uh, hear your story and hear from you and also look at ways that we can support you as a church um, as you journey with Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are good we thank you that you offer us repentance as a way to set us free. And Lord, we invite you once again, or maybe for the first time, into our hearts. And we want to make Jesus our Lord and our King, knowing that we're safe with you. Come Holy Spirit and fill us once afresh today. Amen.